Well, thank you for inviting me to give this address to the FICI IBA Annual Global Banking Conference. Um, I did note all the suggestions, Mr. Neotia, on the last issue of reducing interest rates. I will certainly pass that on to my successor. <laughs> I have a feeling he or she already knows about this issue. Uh, perhaps the most important issue on the minds of bankers today is certainly uh, the results season, which has just passed. Uh, as well as the asset quality review that was initiated in early 2015-2016. Uh, it has certainly improved the recognition of NPAs considerably and provisioning, provisioning in banks has increased uh, significantly. Many of the bankers that we work with have fully imbibed the spirit of the review and have gone beyond what we asked them to do in recognizing incipient stress early. So it has had, in my view, a very positive effect. Now, of course, the focus should move to improving the operational efficiency of the stressed assets, uh, as was discussed earlier, and to create the right capital structure so that all stakeholders can benefit going forward from these projects. And this means action on two fronts. One is, uh, wherever necessary, we have to bring in new project management teams, sometimes as owners, and we're not, that's not possible as managers. And this means a creative search for who these management teams might be, including the use of public sector firms in the business or private sector agents, including retired uh, people as, as management. Plus also, when you don't have them as owners, structuring an incentive package such that they have uh, strong incentives to create good performance. Uh, that means stock options, cash, cash flow, slash profit benchmarks, etc. Of course, in some cases, uh, the existing promoters are fully capable and reliable, uh, and uh, the project uh, difficulties are because of external factors, and of course, in those cases, they should be retained. So that's one aspect, uh, uh, strengthening management. Uh, to put the project back on track. And the second aspect is, of course, tailoring the capital structure going forward to something that's reasonable given what has happened. We have to recognize, we have to let bygones be bygones and look forward. And how do we create the kind of capital structure that gives incentives to all and creates the flexibility needed for the investment, etc., that is required? Uh, if the loan is already an NPA, there is no limit on the restructuring that can be done. Uh, NPAs can be restructured any which way you want. Uh, but if it's standard and the project is struggling, we have a variety of schemes by which a more sensible capital structure can be crafted. Uh, they go by various names, uh, 525, SDR, S4A. Um, I would add one caveat, however, that uh, you know some of these schemes uh, 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 as applied uh, seem to have run into difficulties and I would stress that the real problem is an unrealistic application uh, of uh, uh, these schemes to particular projects more to prevent a loan from turning NPA than from the fact that intrinsically these projects uh, benefit from those schemes. So I would say that going forward given that we've had more recognition a judicious application of the right scheme to the right project could in fact uh, see this work and, and would in fact be beneficial. Uh, from our side, uh, we certainly are happy to listen to suggestions and where necessary make uh, adjustments in the schemes. We've uh, uh, looked at some uh, suggestions for S4A and will be coming out with some adjustments. Uh, but we'll also continue monitoring this this process to see that the schemes are used as warranted and are targeted at promoters who are cooperating and are able rather than those who are misusing the system. These schemes are not meant to be used to give those promoters who are misusing the system an easy ride. Now, enough said about stressed assets. I'm sure you want to look beyond that to growth, and I'm sure you should for uh, the sake of the economy. And I would argue that these are, in fact, interesting, profitable, as well as challenging times for the financial sector. Now, my colleague, Mr. Gandhi, I've read his speech, and just to spoil it a little for you, 
uh, is a little bleaker about the prospects for banking, not, not just here, but overall in the world. But I, I'm a little more optimistic. I, I say interesting times because the level of competition is going to increase manifold, both for customers as well as for talent in the financial system. And this is going to transform even the sleepiest areas in financial services. I think it's going to be profitable because, as you've heard from the dais, uh, many new technologies, a lot of new information, and tremendous new analytical techniques uh, will open up vastly new business opportunities as well as new underserved customers. It's going to be challenging because competition and novelty constitute a particularly volatile mix in terms of risk. And I will talk in, uh, I will speak in the rest of this, uh, uh, in this address on how we see these aspects of the central bank. So let's start first on the interesting and profitable bit, which is, uh, which is the, the nice part. Uh, you know that over the next uh, year, we'll have a whole lot of new niche banks beginning business. Uh, in addition, licensing for universal banks on tap, and so fit and proper applicants, professionals amongst you uh, with innovative business plans, with good track records, with sufficient capital, will enter. And of course, uh, you've heard the saying again and again, uh, the next bank may not be a bank, it may be a fintech company, and fintech is knocking on the door, giving us various ways of accessing customers and serving them. So many new institutions that we barely aware of today will be a source of competition. Now, the good news is a whole lot of new customers will be drawn into the system who don't have access today. That's a positive because that's a new area which can be served. And of course, the customers who are already served will be spoiled for choice because they'll have far more of it. Now, people think that this immediately means that the service provider those sitting in the audience uh, will, will, will be hurt uh, because greater competition tends to reduce spreads. Uh, this certainly is the case, but you will also have significantly more volumes because you can provide a whole set of new services to these customers. India is grossly underbanked at credit to GDP of 50% or 60%. Uh, we are nowhere near where we should be as an emerging market. And, and therefore, that increase in volumes shared no doubt amongst you and your competitors will be an enormous source of new profits. Moreover, and I, I want to emphasize this, risk and cost reduction through information technology and risk management techniques will tend to increase effective risk adjusted spread. So the spread may not in increase, but risk adjusted it may increase because of higher quality spread, you're taking more sensible risks. So I think despite higher competition, profitability can increase. Now, where do banks have a comparative advantage? Clearly, in your access to low-cost deposit financing, to data on your customers, the reach of your existing uh, branch network, your ability to manage and warehouse risk. This is very important. This is perhaps the single most important advantage in the, uh, banks in industrial countries have, the ability to manage and warehouse risks. And, of course, one shouldn't dismiss your ability to access liquidity from the central bank. Your access to liquidity is one of your bigger advantages. Now, going forward, clearly, you want to build on these, product, uh, on these advantages for the products that you offer. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, today, uh, India is on the cusp of immense infrastructure projects. And of course, uh, having been burnt in the past by infrastructure financing, there's a certain amount of reluctance. Um, but the pipeline that is coming is truly amazing. Uh, airports, railway lines, power plants, roads, manufacturing plants. Uh, because of the risk aversion created from past losses, uh, you will be justly careful. You will not lend with a kind of exuberance you had in 2007, 2008. But I'm hopeful this time can be different. And that risks can in fact be lowered while taking on these large projects. And let me talk about the ways that, that this can be done. First, of course, significantly more in-house expertise can be brought to project evaluation, including understanding demand for the project's output, likely competition, 
and uh, the expertise and reliability of the promoter. This time you're going to spend more time on project evaluation and this requires significantly more involvement in the industry to develop industry knowledge and of course you want to do a lot more in-house because now we know consultants can be biased and can produce reports that are not fully accurate. Second, um, wherever possible you now know that real risks have to be mitigated and uh, if they cannot be mitigated, they have to be shared in a clever way. This means, for example, the key permissions for land acquisition and construction should be in place up front, while key inputs and customers are tied up through purchase agreements. Now, sometimes you cannot do this, in which case there should be a way to write this into contracts, perhaps directly, or through a transparent arbitration system so that the project does not get held up indefinitely when in fact what was thought of as happening doesn't happen. So for example, if demand falls below projections, perhaps an agreement between promoters and financiers which is set up front can indicate how in fact equity will be brought in and by whom uh, and when. This then leads to the third element of project structuring, which is an appropriately flexible capital structure. What we've learned from the recent past is we had too much debt. And too much debt, which was inflexible, which was not long-term enough, which uh, was not related to the residual risks of the project. And whatever equity there was, was in some ways fake equity, levered equity brought in by the promoter, which was essentially another form of debt. So going forward, how do we actually have uh, more equity? And in fact, the greater the residual risks of the project that you haven't been able to mitigate, significantly more equity, as well as greater flexibility in the debt structure. How do you create the right incentive structures for promoters for on-time execution and debt repayment? How do you bring in the corporate debt market wherever possible, upfront, uh, and perhaps later as projects Get, uh, get done, how do you securitize and sell off project loans into the market? Um, hopefully some of the measures taken to strengthen the corporate debt markets will make this possible and the bankruptcy code which has just been legislated should make uh, much more arm's length debt, whether securitized debt or corporate bond debt uh, more feasible. Uh, fourth, uh, you've got risks mitigated, you've got a decent capital structure, but as the project takes off, you need a robust system of project monitoring and appraisal, including a real-time careful monitoring of costs. And what I saw here outside uh, from the industry on how, for example, you can monitor client accounts and so on, is something that is very important and can elevate project monitoring uh, to a higher level by reducing the costs of doing so. For example, can you monitor project input costs in a, on a real-time basis and compare with input costs elsewhere using IT so that suspicious transactions suggesting over-invoicing are flagged and are monitored carefully? So can we do this? Can somebody provide the service? Here is what it costs for this particular part and it has been charged twice over, thrice over in this particular situation. And, and finally, of course, we need uh, strong incentive structure for bankers so that they evaluate, design and monitor projects carefully and are rewarded if these projects work out. So, so a reward system uh, for taking the right decisions. This means, I think, uh, that we cannot continue relying on the committee system uh, for decision making entirely. Of course, committees are good, lots of inputs, etc. But some senior person has to take responsibility for the loan and has to put their name on the loan proposal. And nobody should have be held responsible for one project going wrong, but at the time of uh, overall performance appraisal, perhaps a string of projects that this banker has put their name on gets pulled up and their performance then evaluated based on a set of, uh, of decisions, not one single decision. And ultimately, this is, these are commercial decisions not criminal, uh, not subject to criminal oversight or whatever. So wherever there is evidence that you've made mistakes, well, that means you don't get promoted, you don't get your bonuses. But unless there is evidence of money changing hands, that's where it should remain. And it should be a, a question of reward and, and, and not uh, criminal 
uh, punishment. Now, what I've been saying so far is only mildly futuristic. Uh, it doesn't talk about all the fancy stuff, uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, etc., etc. But I think the first task we have to do is use all the new technologies we have to do our existing business better. We have uh, the single most important strength of bankers, uh, certainly in what is to come, is going to be project evaluation and lending. And we need to do a much better job of that, which means drawing in all these, uh, all this information, all these new tools, all the lower transaction costs to doing a much better uh, job marrying information technology and financial engineering with the sensible uh, industry knowledge that many of you have to make better loans that India desperately needs. Now, in this, I would say you have many strengths. We've already talked a little bit about them. But for example, uh, those of you who strongly build out your uh, IT network and your ability to access and serve the broader saver will be rewarded with, with cheap CASA deposits, which can then be used to make all the loans that need to be made. Um, now, let me turn to a second area where there's a lot of competition and, and uh, uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, we've talked about large project loans, but small retail loans is a place where everybody seems to be heading today. And when I look at the numbers, public sector banks are moving away from project loans to the retail customer. And clearly one source of concern is, are we doing the right thing? Are we taking on lower quality risks as everybody then tries to target the retail customer? Uh, and whenever one sees such forms of hurting, one always alarm bells uh, sort of go off. Nevertheless, I think that there are, there are still profit opportunities here if one does appropriate due diligence. Because as you know, new me means and methods of credit evaluation are emerging. Uh, clearly, credit uh, bureaus um, are just one facet of the sources of information here. But banks are increasingly mining their own data to understand their customer better. But also, interestingly, a number of um, new fintech companies are mining data from social media posts. Are you a reliable person on, based on how many angry Twitter comments you send out. Um, so various forms of crowdfunding, intermediated, for example, by peer-to-peer -peer lenders, claim superior credit evaluation. Now, as a central banker, we very much take the notion that we should allow a variety of these innovations in and not be too hasty to regulate. The sandbox is precisely what we have in mind. But at some point, when these start growing bigger, we have to pay more attention so that we understand these much better and eventually uh, we'll have to come in with regulation which doesn't kill the, uh, the, the process but aids it. Uh, and this is where, uh, as far as data goes, just on the point you made, let me just uh, throw out. Ideally, we would like everybody to have access to all the data so that better decisions can be made. Uh, but of course, data is a source of competition also now. So people want to restrict access to their piece of the data while having access to everybody else's data. So how do you allow for more data sharing even while giving people incentives to collect interesting pieces of data? Um, sometimes incomplete data is the worst of all because you're making a decision and you only see the good parts but you don't see the bad parts which are held by somebody else. So how do you see completeness? This is something that we'll have to ponder over uh, over time, uh, certainly it's something that we think about every time when we talk about regulating the credit information bureaus, how much sharing, how much competition, and that's, that's something that we need to think about. Um, I would also caution that, that while it's great to be uh, enthusiastic uh, about FinTech and the new forms of lending, peer-to-peer, -peer, crowdfunding, etc., uh, much of these new forms have yet to be tested by a serious downturn and it's unclear how responsibilities for recovery will devolve between the intermediary who's running these platforms and the investor at such times. And I'm afraid that many of these platforms don't have fully specified who does what and when. Nevertheless, um, with all this information, we can do a much better job even of retail lending precisely because transaction costs are brought down 
and we can track behavior both at, before the loan and after we made the loan for incipient signs of stress. And moreover, because we, can, we have this unique ID now in India, we can track them across the entire system, which means we have a more complete picture. Now, I think what will happen going forward is that banks will not remain sole players here. Uh, these fintech companies will come in and some forms of alliance, which are already starting up between banks and fintech companies will take place. The bottom line, however, is that competition is increasing ways of delivering financial uh, of delivering financial services is changing tremendously and banks have to continuously figure out how to use their traditional although eroding advantages such as convenience information and trust to remain on the competitive frontier um, as I said uh, this combination of innovation and competition is a, is a is a volatile mix because it could lead to uh, financial instability Therefore, one also has to up one's risk management capabilities at the same time. Uh, for us, we want to encourage competition, we want to encourage uh, uh, innovation, but we also care about systemic stability. So how do we play these? How much do we favor incumbents versus new entrants? How much do we favor recognized products versus innovative products? That's a constant uh, uh, dilemma that we have to solve as we go forward. But ideally, we would like to encourage much more competition and much more innovation while preserving financial stability. Now, let me ask uh, how this affects the regulatory compact because what we would like to do is encourage the most efficient processes to emerge so that the economy is benefited in terms of growth our citizens in, are benefited in terms of choice. And this means that ideally we should be institutional neutral, ownership neutral, technology neutral. We should create regulations that doesn't favor any of this. However, we start with a system which is skewed in a number of ways, which favors some institutions and favors uh, uh, some kinds of ownership and therefore competition may not necessarily produce the best outcome. Let me start by saying that Banks have been privileged as well as constrained because of what I call the grand bargain. Uh, essentially, they get the benefits of low-cost insured deposits, liquidity support, and close regulation by the central bank. I'm sure some of you don't think that of that as a benefit, uh, but let me assure you that the public thinks that the fact that they're closely regulated is in fact a benefit and it trusts uh, you with their money. Now, in return, there have been costs imposed on the banks, which is you have to maintain reserves at zero interest rate with the central bank. You have to hold government bonds to meet SLR requirements. And of course, you have the priority sector lending obligations. This applies to all banks, but public sector banks are further subject to government mandates, such as PMJDY accounts, um, opening them, or making mudra loans. I'm just talking about the most recent. Uh, you're also subject to hiring mandates, in particular the need to hire through an open All India exam rather than from specific campuses or from the local community. And you have to meet various government uh, imposed diversity mandates. Now, of course, in further compensation, public sector banks do get more government deposits and business and are in fact backed by the full faith and credit of the government. During this period of stress, nobody has questioned whether in fact any of the public sector banks will survive because that is something that is taken for granted and should be taken for granted because it has the full faith and credit of the government. Now, costs and benefits, what's the net effect? We don't know. But in fact, the point is as competition increases, skewing, skewing a little way this way or skewing a little way that way is going to alter who wins out in the competitive race because the margins may in fact be thin. Which then means that authorities like us, the central bank, or the government, should over the medium term reduce these differences in regulatory treatment between public sector banks and private sector banks, as well as between banks and other financial institutions, so that the full weight of competition and technological innovation can actually play out. Now some of these differences especially within public sector banks and private sector banks, can be mitigated 
if an appropriate price is paid for the mandates. Rather than impose a mandate, for example, if every direct benefit transfer is paid an adequate remunerative price, banks have an incentive to undertake the business and open basic customer accounts. So it's important this be paid and it be paid early rather than a promise which is paid later. If this is done, you don't need to distinguish between private banks and public banks. The, public, uh, the private banks will also enter the business and will compete and the most efficient bank will garner more of the business and over time you can benefit from that efficiency as the government by reducing the payments commensurate with the efficiencies that are created. Now, some of these mandates will also become less costly as you use new techniques. For example, a number of banks are finding ways to make MSME loans more remunerative by using more information as well as reducing the transaction costs. Uh, for example, um, uh, using information on payments. Uh, similar attention could be paid to agricultural loans, especially as farm productivity increases and better agricultural loans could be made. Wider use of the credit bureaus of collateral registries should improve credit evaluation as well as repossession. All this should make priority sector lending much more beneficial than it has been in the past. And today, we also have these priority sector uh, lending certificates which have started trading and so banks that are particularly efficient in making priority sector loans can make more of them and sell those to those who have greater difficulty in making them. So there are ways these mandates can either be paid for or can be reduced in terms of their, the, the extent to which they are onerous. But at the same time we have to continue reducing these mandates so as to make the playing field level, more level. And this is why we've been reducing SLR requirements steadily, and today over half of SLR holdings can be used to meet the Basel uh, mandated liquidity coverage ratios. Uh, we're also trying to make the mandates more understanding of technology. For example, we have a requirement that a quarter of a bank's branches should be opened in underserved areas. But what is a branch? And what can provide adequate services to the population in a particular village? Um, all villages would love to have a full service branch, brick and mortar, open um, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day, uh, fully occupied, but that's costly. Can we service their needs in a better way, in a more efficient way, so that we can cover more, more villages? Uh, given that opening a branch in every village is going to be prohibitively costly given the returns, can we redefine branches such that it meets the needs of the village? Uh, a fixed location at a fixed time uh, for a certain time of the week. Um, an internal RBI committee is looking at these issues and is likely to come up with a report on what constitutes uh, an adequate service uh, to qualify as a branch. Um, so, uh, the bottom line is there are various ways we can reduce the, the impact of these mandates, but we should continue working on them, and this will become especially important as competition increases. We cannot continue having mandates that are not paid for or mandates that are particularly onerous, onerous to one segment of the financial system and not to others. Let me then end with just discussing some of the challenges that are needed uh, to meet the rising competition uh, in the financial system and talk about uh, one specific segment of the population, that is the public sector banks, and how they can, uh, they can, they can rise to those challenges. Now, clearly, today the most pressing challenge is cleaning up the balance sheet, which they're fully engaged in. But a primary task is to improve the governance as well as management of the public sector banks. I'm talking about boards. Um, and to fill out the ranks of middle management that have been thinned out by retirements and by the recruitment freeze that was in place for a long time. What is particularly important is to recruit new talent with expertise in project evaluation, in risk management, and IT, including cybersecurity. So how do we go about this? Let me talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the forces that are emerging here. First, take governance. 
Uh, one of the most important developments in the last few months has been the emergence of the Bank Board Bureau, which consists of eminent personalities with integrity and domain expertise who've taken over the appointment process in public sector banks. There are two ways that the government still plays a role. First, the final decision on appointments is taken by the Appointments com Committee of the Cabinet. And second, the appointment of non-official directors onto bank boards still lies outside the BBB. Now, as the BBB gains experience, it would make sense to allow these decisions to be taken by it so as to fully distance the government from the specific governance processes of the banks. Now, over time, as the bank boards themselves get professionalized, it makes sense for decisions to devolve from the BBB itself to the bank boards. Uh, and this may make sense, especially as the BBB transforms into the bank investment company, which then becomes the custodian of the government stake in the public sector banks. Um, at that point, the Bank Board Bureau should focus essentially on appointing directors to represent the government stake on the bank boards. And the banks should be free to determine their own strategies. One of the problems that every Gyan Sangam has highlighted is too little differentiation amongst public sector bank strategies. But too little differentiation sometimes comes from common control, either from the Ministry of Finance or from the bank board or whoever. And it's important that the bank, the boards of the banks be empowered to determine their own strategies given their own needs. And that process, only then when it's fully done, will we in fact have distinct strategies amongst the public sector banks and walking into a public sector bank branch uh, uh, into Bank A will look different from walking into Bank B's branch. Now, we also need efforts to tighten practice. Too many loans are done without adequate due diligence, without adequate follow-up, collateral when offered is not per perfected, uh, assets given under personal guarantees are not tracked, post-loan monitoring can relax, all these issues we know. And that's why I talked initially about how this can be changed and we should take the lessons of the recent past very seriously and tighten management practice. I think this is not just an economic goal, it is also a political goal. Because unless your unions, unless the public has a sense that public sector banks are treating large promoters in the same way as they treat their small promoters, there will be a resistance to the changes that are needed to make public sector banks on the right footing, because they will say, well, you're not doing your job. Uh, if we are to have public sector banks essentially um, um, get the capital infusion, uh, get the talent infusion, get the buy-in from the unions to make some of the uh, uh, personal changes which I'll talk about short, uh, just now, uh, we need them to convince these stakeholders that in fact they're doing a fair job as far as their large promoters also go, which who are responsible for a significant part of the losses on their balance sheets today. Um, the second aspect, so first is of course tightening lending practices, the second is talent. Uh, you have been thinned by retirements, uh, you need experts in specific areas, uh, and one of the problems of course is that as with all public sector entities, you overpay at the bottom, underpay at the top. I'm sure all of you feel underpaid from the public sector bank. Um, I'm, I also feel underpaid. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's traditional in, in public sector. Um, compensatory um, uh, difference is that yes, you feel that you're doing a job for the broader public, but it does make it hard to attract top talent, especially uh, uh, lateral entry. Now at the same time, the fact that we overpay at the bottom can be a source of opportunity. Uh, in the RBI, we find that our compensation packages for our Class three employees are attractive enough to get really highly qualified people in. We get a lot of engineers, some MBAs in as Class three. So our uh, strategy has been to try and expand the opportunities these people have by saying you're not just going to do clerical work, you're actually going to do much more value enhanced work and you have a promotions uh, path uh, uh, up the bank. In other words, use what seems like a constraint that we overpay at a particular level 
to actually turn it into a strength by trying to attract relatively much better people at that level and give them more responsibility as well as more support, training support, and give them a brighter prospect of advancement into the officer ranks. And I think, um, similarly, the thinning of middle management ranks in public sector banks can be viewed as an opportunity to draw in more younger people and promote them faster, but giving them significantly more support in terms of training, in terms of, uh, to make up for their lack of experience. So, yes, we cannot give them 25 years seasoning as we did in the past, but maybe we can train them much more. And I know many of you are looking at these possibilities, including using online training schemes uh, in order to uh, do this. Um, lateral hires are also important. Uh, many um, banks, uh, as well as public ins sector institutions, have a strong aversion to lateral hires because they break the cadres. And so we tend to say, okay, we'll hire laterally, but only as contractual workers with a limited horizon. Problem with that, of course, is the kind of talents you want to attract is not going to come in for a three-year contract. They're people who want to advance in the hierarchy. So how to make that possible is something that many of you have to think about. Another um, restriction is the court judgment that prohibits hiring from specific campuses. As some of you who participate on the National Institute of Bank Management Board know, it is an anomaly that the National Institute of Bank Management is supported by the public sector banks with funds, but sends almost all its graduates to the private sector banks. So this is a place where public sector banks have their hands tied behind their back because of uh, court judgments requiring them to hire through exams. Now certainly we can petition the courts to take a more liberal view, keeping in mind the objectives the courts have. Uh, but another alternative is to make bank entrance exams much less onerous to take, so that it can be done quickly, that the results are available uh, before campus placements start, so that people from high, uh, from quality institutions will in fact opt for the banks if in fact they know they have a job available. And finally, I think we should be much more liberal in a allowing local hires. There are a number of uh, places in the in the country where getting people to go is difficult, but local uh, talent is available and can do a fantastic job in banking. And I won't name names here, but I have had conversations with some of you. And local hiring, if it can be possible within the structure of the public sector banks, and some public sector banks have done that would in fact improve the quality of decision making locally and also make it easier to get people to stay there and accept more moderate salaries. And, and finally, as banks adopt differentiated strategies, uh, it would become time to move away from the common industry-wide compensation structures and common industry-wide promotion schemes to something which is more bank-based and will allow banks, in fact, to have a, a, a different way of compensating. Now, I think go, going forward, also better ways of incentivizing employees, including employee stock up ownership plans, will give many of the employees in the bank a stake in the future. Um, two other aspects that public sector have, banks have to focus on. One that has already been mentioned is customers. Many of you have a strong bond with customers who trust the public sector bank. I think on trust, public sector banks score very high. Can that bond be strengthened? And in this time of difficulty, should one focus on improving access to such deposits rather than in fact turning away de deposits? I'm a, I'm a little perturbed sometimes when I see the slow growth of public sector bank deposits. Of course, there's a natural link between lending and deposits. The loan that you make comes back as a deposit. But I would like to believe also that public sector banks are continuously working on their deposit franchise because that will be the source of strength as they move forward. In this regard, I would like to mention our five-point charter of consumer rights that we put out. Banks were asked to try and implement this uh, by July uh, this year, and we're going to go look at the implementation. I think this is an area where public sector banks can, in fact, take the lead and strengthen the customer experience so that, in fact, they build a stronger customer franchise. And, and lastly, uh, structure, 
Um, there is, of course, a, as banks get cleaned up, uh, decisions to be made on strategy and structure. Should some public sector banks focus more on small finance, become small finance banks? Should others merge and become part of a all India network so as to obtain scale and geographic diversification? My sense is as banks clean up their balance sheets, this is an issue that will become more important. And as their boards are strengthened, their boards should reflect on these issues and think about uh, the overall structure. Now, none of these changes are in fact easy, but they're not impossible. Uh, requires work with the unions, persuading them of the need for change that benefits all, especially the long-term future of the bank. And um, I think that it is something that is eminently feasible by the public sector banks today. And I fully agree with the sentiment, we do need public sector banks. They have to be part of the landscape. What is important is they shouldn't be unduly favored or at the same time unduly hampered as competition increases. Now, let me end by saying this also uh, means that authorities have to reflect on their role vis-a-vis uh, -vis the public sector banks. Uh, today we have a variety of organizations, Parliament, the Department of Financial Services, the Bank Board Bureau, the Board of the Banks, the Vigilance Authorities, and of course regulators and supervisors like the RBI, monitoring the public sector banks. Given so many entities you have to deal with, it's a miracle you get any work done. But uh, uh, it's important that we in fact streamline this process and reduce the overlaps between the jurisdictions of authorities and specify clear triggers or situations where one authority's oversight is invoked. So I would argue that given the emerging landscape, it is quite clear what needs to, ha be, what needs to happen. Much of the governance has to move eventually to the bank's board. The government has to exercise control through its board representative who is chosen by the Bank Board Bureau or the BIC, keeping in mind the best interests of the bank and the interests of the minority shareholders. So the government has to work through its representative on the board. And wherever possible, public sector banks uh, and their boards should be bound by the same rules as private sector banks and their boards. Uh, one reason why we have recently withdrawn the calendar of reviews that public sector banks were asked to undertake is because it was proving onerous and it's something we didn't ask the private sector banks to do. Similarly, board membership of public sector banks should pay as well as board membership of private sector banks. We're not trying to attract different people, we're trying to go to the same pool, so there should be uniformity in pay. Now, as the decision-making, the governance moves away from the Department of Financial Services, it should perhaps move more towards a program role, ensuring that government programs like PMJDY, uh, et cetera, are well-designed, properly remunerated to the banks, and monitored for, for rollout. It could provide a coordinating role, for example, how banks come together to do KYC. It could also provide a development role, for example, as recently done, revitalizing institutions like the debt recovery tribunals through appropriate legislation. So there is a lot for the DFS to do, even as it moves away from directly governing the banks. What about the RBI? Well, we would want to move away from governing the banks. We would want to withdraw our representative from bank boards. This requires, unfortunately, legislative change. But we would also want to empower the bank boards for instance, by offering broad guidelines and compensation of top management and board members to the boards, but not requiring that every compensation package be approved by us. Uh, given this movement towards strong oversight by the bank's board, uh, the CDC and the CAG should get involved only in extraordinary situations where there's evidence of malfeasance and not when legitimate business judgment has gone wrong. Now, I've focused on the challenges of uh, public sector banks in meeting the new competitive environment. Um, this should be viewed as opening a discussion rather than the formal views of the RBI, which uh, in fact uh, will evolve over time. That I have not discussed the challenges that private sector banks will face is not because I think they're perfectly positioned, but I think that the public sector banks start off with more challenges uh, to deal with uh, 
But let me end with, I think, an area of emerging challenge for all, which is cybersecurity. Uh, as you know, there have been some cyber incidents in the recent past. I would think it's overly complex and for any of us to believe that we're well prepared to meet all cyber threats. Uh, you, many of you have heard this chilling statement from Nike expert. We've all been hacked. The only question is whether you know it or you don't. Uh, while the statement may be alarmist, it is an antidote to complacency. We have to examine our security culture. Too many access points and too many banks are left unmonitored. Too many people share passwords or have easily penetrated passwords. Too little surveillance is maintained of vendors and the software they create. Now we are working, uh, the RBI is working on upgrading the capabilities of our inspectors to undertake banking system audit as well as detecting vulnerabilities in them. Uh, specifically, we're setting up a subsidiary which already has a CEO and is now recruiting the second line, which will recruit directly from industry, do things like ethical hacking, and will give us a better ability to manage and supervise technology. But I would say that even as we're looking at our system, all of you need to look at your systems every day, and more important, apart from the systemic change, the cultural change on cybersecurity is extremely important, and I hope you will need it in your banks. So let me end. I've taken a lot of your time, but thanks for your patience. Uh, we will be living in very interesting times. Uh, whether it's a blessing or a curse, as the Chinese sometimes say, is entirely up to us, though I'm confident that we will indeed rise to the occasion. Thank you very much.